Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois, and we have got a great show for you today. We are going to be unveiling a new project that the Good Growing crew is working on. Uh, it's going to be exciting, and we want you, dear listener, viewer, to participate so before we dive into that, let's get into who we have on the show. And you know, I'm joined as always every single week by horticulture educator, Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris. I'm excited for our new venture. It's going to be a venture. That's for sure. Adventure, venture. Um, uh, we're investing a lot of capital in this, aren't we? Um, yeah. So. Yes. yes. Both mind, physical, mm -hmm. monetary, maybe not monetary. But space in the yard, it's very valuable. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. That's right. And we are also joined by good growing horticulture educator, Emily Zweihart in, now let me get this right, Milan, Illinois. Yes. Ooh. Yes. We had, a, we had a debate about how we pronounce this thing before we started recording everybody. So Emily, welcome to the show, who is also in Milan, Illinois. <laughs> Thanks, guys. And I like that tease that you just you just did for our upcoming project. I think that's enticing. Mm -hmm. Yes. And after an hour, we will get to it. Um, <laughs> but first, these messages. Um, no, no. Uh, we're, we, we, will, we will dive into the project that we have in mind very soon. Um, but there's a lot of interesting things in the year of 2024, some new stuff in the plant world. Um, Emily and Ken, we were both, we we're all together uh, up in, was it, well, where were we? So that Emily's was Moline. <laughs> okay, that was Moline. That was in okay. Moline. Quad cities confuse me. There's so many of them. Um, but so we were in Moline at a conference and we were like just geeking out on our phones. Um, like, Ken, what did you show us? It was this wackadoodle petunia. Yeah, so there's a glowing petunia now. Apparently, it's so they took. I'm not entirely sure how they did it. I haven't read up on it. Hopefully, one of you two did your homework. But they took the genes or something from was it mushrooms? There's mm -hmm. so there's yeah. some species of mushrooms that will fluoresce at night, and they took those genes and put it into a petunia, and it apparently glows at night. And here, gonna cut in real quick. We did our homework on how this bioluminescence is actually working. So, this actually first started taking place back in the 1980s, where scientists took the gene from fireflies for luciferase and inserted that into tobacco plants and this kind of gave off a faint glow but the plants needed special food in order to produce this kind of the breakthrough here is that they took the genes from a bioluminescent mushroom and put that into the plants and this allowed them to sustain that reaction that glowing reaction without the use of special food and now we'll return to the podcast I think I said the, like the bud's new growth um, glows the most. I mean, you're not, it's not going to be a nightlight or anything like that, but I think it's just kind of a faint glow that they give off now. So, and they are being sold to the public, which you don't normally see with GMO, however you want to define those crops. A lot of times those are more commercial. We think about agriculture anyway, uh, signing agreements and all that fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I was reading about it. It's interesting. I don't know how exactly they did it either, but um, the company, you know, the the article that they were um, using to uh, describe this new plant, it's called Firefly Petunia, if folks want to look it up. Um, apparently, this company has been working on incorporating um, some of these luminescent genetics into plants for nearly 40 years. Um, you know, they've been working on it, trying to to kind of figure out the right um, equation how to how to do it so this is not necessarily new and then also with like gmos um usda does rigorous testing it, it, ken you said you know that they're not always um, available to the commercial homeowner and so um this one's different it's been deemed to be um little to no risk so you gonna get one i'm, I'm working on my wife so also they're, they're not cheap right and the shipping is rather high too so yes the shipping, the shipping is what got me so i'm, I'm working on her so yeah. i'm getting too much trouble yeah 
Can I had a question? I was reading through this and you have not, I did not uh, pre-ask you this. So if you don't quite know the answer, you can get back to me, which would be fine. But um, so the glow at night and the, the, from what I was reading and understanding, the glow is actually quite a bit brighter than what the original um, plant source was, the mushrooms. Is there a thought on how that affects insects, like especially like, you know, nighttime active insects at all? I'm not sure. I think it probably a little bit depend on how bright it is. I doubt it's it's bright enough like a light where you'd have too much interruption, but I don't, I'm not sure. I, I will add, so I did read a paper because I got uh, grilled one time during a presentation about petunias and hybridization and pollinators. And someone said, I never see pollinators on petunias during the day. In their native range in South America, petunias are pollinated by night moths. So I don't know if that plays into a bioluminescent petunia glowing in the dark at night. Will it draw more moths in? Uh, maybe. Um, so I read that paper because I, I wanted to know more, like how do petunias get pollinated uh, in the wild? Turns out they're night pollinated. Sounds like an experiment in the making. That's right. This, we'll need some coffee for that one to keep us awake. <laughs> Lots of it. I may have to start drinking coffee. <laughs> well, I'll just keep I, going yeah. with it through the day. <laughs> mm -hmm. I uh, still got thought. some right here. Yes. Uh, well, there is another GMO in the news. Um, this one is an edible GMO. And, oh, I, I can't remember uh, who, who put this in front of me first. I don't know if it was uh, Ken or Emily. Uh, could have been our colleague Andrew. I'm not sure who put this in front of me. I didn't find it, but one of someone of you guys told me about it. Can someone tell me about this tomato I've been hearing about? Well, can I think you introduced it to me? So I'm not sure where you found it, or if you did find it in your your interweb perusings. But um, so there's a purple tomato. Um, we have purple skin tomatoes, right? But the, this one's purple all the way through, and it is such because it's got a snapdragon gene that has been um, added to the mix, you know, through so the magic of science, it's not magic of science. Um, the idea, the researcher who, from what I read, was trying to create more foods that are higher in antioxidants. And so like it was, it was developed with the intention of it being able to be consumed, which I think is interesting. Um, and, you know, antioxidants are, um, Plants that are purple or have more purple hue to them are higher in um, flavonoids, which is related to antioxidants. I'm not a food nutrition person, but um, antioxidants basically help um, your body fight off like free radicals and um, you know, different types of ailments. Um, so it can improve health. I think that is the that was the objective, the reason for doing this now. Um, yeah, I think. That's why they like with rice, GMO rice, they what they put in there, beta carotene to help. Build, build uh, to, rice. Mm -hmm, yeah, build. So if if rice in a developing country, if that is the only thing you have access to, it at least has a little bit of that beta carotene to help uh, in your body's development. So um, I think, yeah, with the similar thing with the Snapdragon, which I learned Snapdragons, those are edible too. Well, that's fascinating. I'm going to have to eat all my Snapdragons now. Um <laughs> And so, the, yeah, so when, and, and I guess people have been asking, well, how do they do this? Well, when the tomato meets a Snapdragon and they come together and then you introduce genetic editing using CRISPR, you can take the specific genes out and put it into another uh, organism. So fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So a little bit different from traditional uh, breeding, I will say. And I think there'll probably be people on both sides of the, the argument here of to be or not to be. Yeah, I think, to my knowledge, this is the first food crop GMO that is that you as a homeowner or just the general public is able to buy. Again, typically, you think about your GMO corn, soybeans, all of that stuff. You know, there's sites for commercial production, and you're you have to sign your life away. Mm -hmm. You're not quite that bad, but you got you got to sign agreements that you're not going to save seed and, um, you know sell sell it and all that stuff so with this one though you can buy it directly from the company 
Uh, you are, it is restricted to personal use. So you can't sell the fruit. You can't sell the plants, but I do think they say you can save seed mm -hmm. uh, and stuff and you can use it to, you know, if they breed with other tomatoes, you can use those, but you can't sell them. Uh, so it is available to the masses. And I heard about it on, on NPR. So just pulling into the office one day and I had to sit in my car for a little bit until I <laughs> heard the end of the, the segment, but why is Ken sitting in his car for 20 minutes? Yes. Yes. And with this one, you know, normally when we think purple tomatoes, it's the skin that's purple, but this one, the flesh is purple as well. So when you look, when you see pictures of it and before people complain, we don't have permission to use pictures. So that's why you're not going to see a picture. You'll have to, Get on the, was it the Mrs. Google Pants? Mm -hmm. Mrs. Google Pants. Mm -hmm. And um, so I know tomatoes are a fruit, but it looks like a, a fruit. You know, it, it's that color, purple color all the way through. I'm trying to think of what it would kind of look like. But yeah, it's like a grape. It's, it's a, yeah, I would say it's a cherry mm -hmm. tomato. So it's a small, you know, it's not a slicer or a paste tomato. It's a cherry tomato. So it's small, but yeah, it kind of looks like a good. Although grapes, purple grapes are green inside, so. Yeah, like, yeah. The the main thing I think that people are talking about with this particular tomato um, is tomatoes. I mean, well, there's probably thousands of different types of tomatoes. Some look very, very ornamental and pretty, but taste awful. And so I think the flavor is going to determine whether this is something that's going to catch on or not. Um, I've personally never tasted this particular tomato i hope to this year um but I, I think flavor and taste is going to determine whether this particular purple tomato is just a one-off novelty or is going to maybe become more of a staple in a, in a garden i was reading some an article somewhere i don't remember where but somebody in the comments had said that they had tried some at a conference or a trade show and they said it tasted good like better okay. than a regular grocery store tomato so, which mm -hmm. isn't necessarily a very high bar. Yeah. But <clears throat> step away from water. Yep. Um, <laughs> now so, I'm saying, and, and saying these are cherry tomatoes, so they are indeterminate. So, if this is something you want to grow, just keep that in mind. And again, these are not, these are much more expensive than your typical tomatoes. as well. I, I did order them. Did, did either of you order some? I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. We'll have to report back. Yes, we will. Well, so lo weird things popping up this year, as I said, in 2024 in the plant world. Um, and I, I guess the question is, every year we have the episode where we talk about what are we growing? And it's always new and different. And a lot of times something we've never tried before. So, Emily, I let me ask you. Do you think there's like a benefit to trying new stuff in the garden? Like why, why do we like to do this as gardeners? Um, I don't think I would be exaggerating if I said, I think a million percent, there's a reason to grow new things in the garden <laughs> um, I, as gardeners. So it depends on what your objectives are, of course, but there's like, we just talked about, there's always new things being developed. Like that's the fun that's the art of horticulture, right? Is the, is selection and breeding and, and the development, of all of these new um, cultivars. And there's just not enough growing seasons. At least I'm not counting on enough growing seasons in my lifetime to grow everything possible. So there's always something new to grow and explore. And you never know like what is your next favorite thing to grow. Um, so I think today we're going to be talking primarily about growing new um, food crops. And so, um, to me, like, it's just, you can, you can grow such unique things in your landscape. Um, if you try to get kind a of branch out, um, it also challenges you as a gardener, as a grower, like, um, today we'll talk about a few things that none of us have ever grown before. Um, who knows how they're going to turn out? It might be an epic disaster, <laughs> but there's lessons to be learned and there's fun to be had in that. Um, we might also find like some of our new favorite plants to, to grow and eat. Um, maybe our kids will get some excitement out of it. We all have young children. You know, it's fun to grow kind of weird things, unexpected things, um, you know, and, and just see what 
what comes of it throughout the year. And it's a pretty low investment. We're going to talk about annuals. Like, you don't like it. What are you out one year? You know, we're not planting our entire garden to all these crops. So there's, you know, it's a pretty low risk for a potential, like, really big reward, a really fun, fun outcome. I also, you'd asked me this question earlier, you know, about like, why should we try new things? And there's actually research that suggests that it um, helps trigger um, dopamine production in your brain. So like happy hormones, right? You feel better when you're trying new things. It's a creative act. And so um, I, I, it's hard for me to conceive as to how I could get more joy out of gardening and growing, but let's do it. Let's give it a shot with these new things. And um, so that's all the reasons why I think, like I said, a million percent reasons why we should uh, gr uh, grow and try new things. You guys, I feel like I maybe bullied you into doing this. You do this anyways, but this, this project, I feel like maybe um, you were suckered into doing, which I'm glad. But are you okay with it? Are you okay with doing this project? I am. And if I wasn't, it's too late now. Absolutely. It is too late. We are committed. But, but you guys do this anyways. Like you have grown and we've talked about this in the past. You guys have grown new things every year. You try new things. Like why do you do it? Well, I'll say Ken inspired me to do this more and try to include my family in it. And so, uh, Ken, you had described how you like give your kids a couple seed mag catalogs and you say, you know, what are you interested in? Circle something. And so I did that this year. And of, of course, my kids picked like the biggest watermelon and the biggest pumpkin. So <laughs> we're going to try that. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Um, but uh, it, it's something new and different for them and me. And so, Ken, you are my inspiration that really got me down this garden path. So how but I mean, is this something you also did as a as a kid? Were you growing weird stuff in the backyard? Um, we had a vegetable garden. I don't really remember growing anything weird out of the ordinary. I, don't know. I just like growing weird stuff. <laughs> <laughs> stuff you can't find in the store. Try new things. I mean, like, so we've tried, you know, we grew peanuts for a few years. You know, I like growing those, but you don't get enough peanuts off of the plants to really do much. So we've stopped that. But cotton, I don't know how many years we've been growing cotton now, but we've grown that every year. You know, because it's a nice ornamental and artichokes we've grown for a couple of years now we'll probably keep growing those every year so and there's stuff we've grown that we haven't like peanuts that you know we like but just wasn't worth it or other things that didn't work out and we're not gonna grow it anymore but we can say we tried and now we have a reason for not growing it <laughs> well we have been teasing this project now for oh 15 minutes so maybe we should dive into what exactly we are talking about um so we, we, we did get together and Emily had a wonderful idea, you know, what, what if, you know, we were talking about, Hey, let's, let's grow some of these different things in our gardens. And, and Emily said, what if we invite you, the listeners and viewers to come along with us and we even supply the seed. And so uh, it started out as the, the good growing unofficial official trial. Um, we have rebranded that into the grow along. So we would like you, viewer, listener, to grow along with us. And we have selected six different crops that, at, at least the varieties, um, the, the names of these different crops, none of us have, have ever grown before. Maybe some somewhat, maybe uh, I think Emily, Ken, you both mentioned you've grown a couple of these. Um, I have not, I've not grown any of these um, before. So I am, I am excited to try these in my garden. And um, I, I guess, you know, we should probably ask, why are we doing this? Did I explain why we're doing this? Should you edit this part out, Ken? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> why not? Why not? <laughs> there you go. Why not? Well, I guess I'm thankful that you all agreed to go along with this idea because you've the listeners to the podcast and the readers of the blog are are the reason at least that I get so excited about work, right? Like it's sharing this love, sharing this passion, sharing this experience with people. Um and so why not 
takes like a bunch of the risk out of it. All we're asking viewers and, and listeners to invest in this is a little bit of garden space and a little bit of time. And then you get to try something new. So, you know, why, why not? And, and we have six, Chris, like you said, we have six things. You don't have to grow all of them. You don't have, you can choose one of the, one of the um, species to grow along with it. You can choose all six if you want, but you don't, you know, kind of pick and choose and see, see what, um, what is of interest to you, what you might like to eat. So we didn't really talk about how we came to the six of these um, species. Um, we were all, you know, it was a very cold winter day. I think when we got together and the Steve catalogs had arrived. So we all had sparkles in our eyes and um, we're looking at all the new, the new things and talking about different options. And so, um, you know, kind of said like, let's, um, let's pick things that span, you know, the flavor profile, right? Different growing conditions. Some are really compact, some are upright, just so that we can make it available to, to um, more people. So do you have anything to add? I, I, I mean, we all kind of brainstormed, right? I don't even know who, who brought what to the table, but um, brainstormed some different ideas. And, and, and one thing, so we, Obviously, we had all kinds of stuff. We had a big old spreadsheet full of stuff of things we all picked and then and kind of winnowed it down. And I think one thing to point out is everything that we picked can be direct seeded. Uh, so you don't want to have to have any seed starting capabilities. That's there are some like, things you need to start early or or start indoors that we kind of got rid of just so that's not a barrier uh, to anybody doing this. These are all yeah. uh, except maybe one all are going to be put out after frost. Uh, but they can all be direct seeded and get it grow successfully. So I guess we should probably tell people what we are planning to grow. Um, and again, these are going to be crops that are primarily, these are all edible crops, um, different. And, and as we were narrowing down the field here, um, I mean, I was really looking at just cool names and I think this first one <laughs> yeah. is the, who has the best name. Um, so, uh, Ken, could you tell us about the runner bean, who the the name of this one is the Black Knight? Um, so, I mean, this is like our Batman here in the garden. <laughs> yes, I think most people are probably, or a lot of people are probably familiar with Scarlet Runner Bean. So that's your, I'd say probably your typical runner bean. I just as an aside, going through this and looking at all the different runner bean cultivars there are, there's a ridiculous amount. I didn't realize how many there were. <laughs> um, so your, your your typical scarlet runner bean, you got your bright red um, flowers, and they have green pods that they produce. And those you can eat those beans, those pods kind of as a green bean, or let them dry down, and you can use the seeds uh, once they've dried. Uh, with Black Knight, so you still have those nice red scarlet flowers. Uh, it's still... You know, runner beans is going to be vining, so you're going to need a little bit of room or a trellis to grow this on. But the seed pods um, are this really dark purple, almost black color. So I think you'll get a nice, in pictures I've seen, again, we don't have any pictures to show you because we have not grown this particular uh, type of runner bean. But there's a nice contrast with the green leaves. You got the red flowers and you have these dark purple, almost black uh, seed pods on them. So be good for an ornamental. Um, that you can also eat if you so choose. So our next crop that we decided to grow, I remember bringing this one to the table. Um, so I, uh, one of the things I looked for was maybe like a one that was noted for good performance all around. So I went to the All-American Selection website and I kind of just perused, you know, the, the multiple years of winners on that one. And so I brought uh, to the table uh, an okra plant. And this particular one is called Candle Fire. Uh, it is a hybrid, um, but it is a, a fairly different type of okra. Now, I, I'm familiar with okra having like ribs and ridges going down the length of the pod. This one is does not have that. It's like cylindrical. It's smooth. Um, and it, they're this bright red. So Candle Fire, bright red okra pods. Um, they also have red stems. And so... Kind of like that's uh, that black knight uh, being. This is a pretty plant. Like this is an ornamental plant. And now, as I'm thinking about all of these other crops we picked, they're all really 
have an ornamental appeal to them. So, I mean, you could put this okra in your front yard probably, and it would look good. And people would be like, oh, that's a cool shrub that you got there. What are the pods hanging off of them? Oh, they're okra. You can eat them. Excellent. So, um, so it is a, since it's an AAS winner, all American selection, um, that means it's been evaluated across the United States and it has been rated very high on its performance throughout the U.S., which means this one's probably should do well throughout Illinois. Um, again, this is barring any crazy weather that we might have, but, um, you know, it, it should thrive in like good, our heat, our summer heat that we have um, does have some decent disease resistance bred into it. And so it's, it, it, it's a very versatile okra plant. So I am excited to use this. And the other thing I noted that okra seeds, I did not realize this are a coffee substitute, but there's no caffeine in it. So if you want a decaffeinated coffee, harvest your okra, get the seeds out, dry them and roast them and grind them up and you got decaffeinated coffee. I'll pass. I like my caffeinated <laughs> coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's fun to know. I'll have to. Uh, I was excited, <laughs> Chris, when you brought okra to the table. I've never grown okra, any cultivar. I'm not even sure I've ever eaten okra. And so I'm going to have to do some recipe searching and uh, I welcome viewers to share any of their favorite okra recipes um i'm ex i'm excited about this and I, I thank you for bringing this one to my garden fry it fry it, fry it. okay i like it personally i like it plain just eat it right off the plant yeah does get may turn some people but it does get a little kind of snotty uh, so that's something to keep in mind so <laughs> what do you mean it's by that Little, uh mucusy. Okay. When when you eat it sometimes, so okay. just keep that in mind. If, if you're eating it raw, if you cook it, it's not. In my experience, when you fry it and stuff, it, you don't have that anymore. Okay, okay. okay. gross. I know. <laughs> is that I was trying to think? Is that why the Southerners say you Northerners <laughs> can't grow okra because it gets snotty? Um, <laughs> but well, we will find out this year. It again, yeah. candle fire okra. Um, and we, I think we probably could pop a picture in of that because All American Selections does allow us to use pictures. So we might pop one in of that um, here or before. So, uh, Ken, you're driving the boat this week. So, uh, yeah. Randomly pop it up. Here we go. Right now. Ah! Right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this next one, I, I don't remember if it was if it was me or might've even been a joint effort because when we saw the picture of this next crop, we were just like, Whoa. And, and this is one that is a, a little bit different than all the others. Now, again, they can all be direct seeded known for growing throughout the summer, but this one, which is a, a Mizuna, uh, it's called Japanese pink and Mizuna is like, um, kind of an ornamental. Yeah. Emily has a picture of it right there as, as like ornamental has these bright purple stems and these dark green leaves. So again, very pretty. But Mizuna is more of a cool season type crop. It's a green, and so it performs better probably in the spring and the fall. Um, doesn't mean that we can't maybe keep growing this uh, throughout the growing season, but you know, if you wanted to target probably the, the, the time of the year when you're going to get really uh, good flavor, it's more than likely with with generally speaking our greens is going to be during the cool times of year um and so this is a, it's an asian green it's something that you can use raw it is also something that you can throw into a stir fry and it holds up um so uh, i i think what was the description that i read it's an upscale uh green so um you have to eat this with your pinky up uh just <laughs> that's just the rule i guess uh it's you know one of those rules that you sign when you buy the seed um but it's it, it I, I am excited to grow this one, if not for having a, a kind of an interesting uh, kind of uh, Asian green that I can add to some of my cuisine. This thing just looks so pretty. I, I, I'm probably going to maybe try it in some containers and see how it does and and maybe move it around the yard. It is a brassica. Um, just want to, you know, while we're trying these, I guess maybe we haven't made made the comment, which is do pay attention to. Um, crop rotation as we're as you're considering joining us for di these different um, crops so um, it's a brassic ACA um, plant and so where you had broccoli um, 
cauliflower, cabbage, all those things last year. Don't plant it there. And, right. and it's considered frost hardy. So again, I'm probably, I'm probably going to plant some in the spring and I might hold some seed back for a fall planting later on this year. Yeah. And so with, with the ones we've talked about so far, you could still, I mean, if you've got the capabilities, you could start these indoors and transplant. So you're not, no. you're not required to, to direct seed them. Yeah. And I think Chris, you're right. We did a number of us brought this uh, to the table. Um, I think I did suggest it too. And I just like that. It's called Japanese pink because I'm here for anything pink. So. Mm -hmm. It'll be fun mm -hmm. to try. Malibu pink. Yep. That was my favorite color. Old Barbie. <laughs> Going down the list. Can I talk about the next one that I also chose because of the name and the way it looks, which is the. <laughs> I'm just going to give everyone permission to do that. That's fine. Do some research, make sure that it's an okay plant to put in your landscape, but it's fine to go for the plants that are, I think, adorable, um, is the way I would describe this next one, um, and the name. So it's an acorn squash. It's called Honey Bun, and it is, um, I've grown acorn squash in the past, and so, um, you know, I, I do like acorn squash, so I'm expecting to enjoy eating um, Honey Bun, but this one is... It's described as um, like striking uh, dumpling squash. So it's smaller in size than your traditional um, acorn squash, which for me was appealing. I'm about the only one in my family that likes acorn squash. They, my family likes other squash um, varieties. And so having a kind of a personal sized um, acorn squash was appealing. The outside of it is kind of a dappled um, dark green, yellow um, coloration, which is, it's eye catching. It could be ornamental. Um, you know, acorn squash can store for a while. And so you could use it kind of as a fall decoration while you're waiting, you know, for the next meal where you're going to have um, acorn squash. It's got some resistance to powdery mildew, intermediate resistance to it, which is, which is appealing with, uh, you know, our hot humid summers that powdery mildew can, can sneak up on you with those, um, um, those squash varieties. And so um, very excited. Very excited about honey bun. Um, you guys fans of acorn squash? Or are we just doing this because I liked the name and thought it was adorable? I, like I mean, acorn squash. We're, just, we're more I, of a usually do butternut. But mm -hmm. I'm also butter. a fan of honey buns. The yeah. pastry. <laughs> it is a pastry. After there's, I think it's like Little Debbie or someone makes honey buns. So, yeah um those are good too so this should taste just like that that did not occur to me <laughs> it has been decades <laughs> since i've had honey buns and now i'm going back to that time <laughs> but uh maybe it could be a whole meal honey buns um squash mm -hmm. honey buns as your carbohydrate yes we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> Well, I'll finish with my my choices here too. So the next one would be cucumber, uh, lemon cuke. I have grown this one before. This was not my suggestion, but since I've, I have grown it um, before, <laughs> I am happy to grow it again because I I liked it. So it's, a, um, it's an heirloom cucumber and it has um, a lot of different characteristics that are not, you would not identify this, I don't think, to the untrained eye as a cucumber based on the fruit. So it's described as, you know, it says it's lemon. Well, it's round. Um, it does have a yellow flesh. It's a thinner flesh. This is what I really like about it. And this is why I actually prefer this to um, a traditional cucumber. I don't like the flat, the skin, you know, of a regular cucumber. I always peel it off. I don't, I do not care for it. Um, this is a, a thinner um, flesh and it's a milder and sweeter flavor. And so I don't mind eating it. You could eat it like an apple because it's about apple size and it's it's very um it's pleasant it to me no i'll save it i'll let every i'll i'll save my my comments about the actual flavor of it till later i'll let everybody grow it and try it but um it's also um more of a bush variety and so i when i grew it i put it on a small trellis 
Um, it wasn't this huge vining um, cucumber. It was just on like a three foot trellis. And that did help um, create some airflow through um, help with some um, management of, of disease. Also was they're smaller fruits. And so easy to harvest, kind of ornamental in the garden. Um, you can do that. You don't have to stake it. You can um, let it grow in the ground if you want. But um, yeah. Are you guys, have, neither one of you have grown lemon? Nope. Not no. lemon. Nope. Okay be a new one all right excellent i will say too though when um folks are growing this one of the mistakes i made is that i thought like um it, it was harder ish to figure out when to harvest it because it just kept getting like brighter and brighter um lighter yellow is better there's like a there's a, a sweet spot and luckily cucumbers usually produce quite a bit and so you can kind of play around with like exactly when to harvest it but it'll turn like more like golden orange as it as it matures and then it's it um becomes a little less um less favorable to eat still edible but um, kind of loses that some of that sweetness some of that um tenderness that those earlier those lighter yellow fruits um, would have so if folks choose to grow it just don't be afraid to harvest it when it starts turning kind of just like a, a lemon colored yellow use it for just fresh Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i didn't do any processing with it sometimes we would make um like cucumbers um into pickles but that year we didn't do any of the we didn't process any any um cucumbers so um i had heard um one thing i might try this year with it is to freeze um do like a freezer pickle i've never done that so in addition to growing something that's a little unusual i might try a different preservation method um we'll see tbd on that one but um if, if it goes um like most of the cucumbers uh, crops go that i have i'll have a lot of extras to play around with get the green food coloring out so people aren't confused <laughs> so ken i think you have the last yes, one i have the last one uh so this is one i've never grown before this this type of plant so it's southern pea uh, or cow pea and what are some other names there's all kinds of different names uh crowder pea black eyed pea lubia nibi coop friole there's all kinds of different names you can call these plants um, this one specifically is called hog brain which is pretty much why i picked it because <laughs> it's a cool name <laughs> and reading the you know the description from the the company they're not really sure why it was called hog brain was it because it was cooked with hog brains to the somehow remind people of hog brains so not sure why it's hog brain but that's what it is um so southern peas um so this is you know even though they're called peas they're actually um a bean um so they can be um, shelled and eaten fresh so kind of still immature once those peas or beans get kind of full size before they harden um, or you can dry them um, and use as a as a dried product. Uh, they can be roasted like peanuts. Um, apparently, scorched seeds have been used as a coffee substitute, so you can have your cow pea and um, okra coffee there. So, uh, and and this is from reading a little bit about more about cow peas. This is kind of one of the first among the first plants domesticated by humans. So these are native to Africa. Uh, so this is these are probably more popular in southern states uh well they like a little warmer temperatures but i think this one is has got a short enough growing season at 62 days on uh, that 62 day 62 days is until you can get harvest those um those fresh beans use them as fresh and then add a couple weeks onto that if you want them dried so we still should have plenty of time even if we're direct seeding those in you know may or something like that so excited to try that one that's that's a new one on the list I was I was really all about this one too, Ken. I there's something about trying to grow um, beans where they can be dried and stored. Um, and I I just see that as as a potentially a valuable food source uh, for for our gardeners and and people that want to try to grow their own food. And so, I and I've never grown a, a bean to try to harvest the the beans out of it dried and 
and and then and then eat those. It's always been green beans for me. It's like 100% everything I've ever eaten, green beans. Um, all the dried beans have just been stuff I bought at the grocery store. So I'm I'm really excited to try this one. That's why I was really, yeah, when you brought this up, I'm like, oh yeah, we should really try this because I would, my goal is to grow it out to a dried bean state and and preserve it that way. Yeah, and not just for this one, for us, for our garden at home, basically any green bean we grow now, we buy a cultivar or variety or cultivar that can also be used as a dried bean because inevitably we don't pick them in time. And that way we can just let them pick the the dried bean, like uh, rattlesnake, I think is one we've done in the past. So you can pick it as a green bean or let it dry. So that's that's kind of where we've gone in our home garden. So we don't lose that's stuff. That's a really good idea because yeah, those those uh beans inevitably do get away from. I think all of us mm -hmm. we're busy. Yeah. We have lots going on, so it, it always feels wasteful to me whenever you know like a green bean gets passed and I get real frustrated. And so, um, yeah, I had not explored this. So same with you, Chris. Like I, I love the idea of having dried beans grown in the garden. Um, I might do the coffee substitute. I, like, we should do that. We should give it a shot. Do a we, can, we can try. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, I, and maybe folks growing at home in our grow along, our good growing grow along would like to try the coffee substitute as well. You don't have to, um, but I think it's probably time to say to, to let everyone, like, first off, ask some questions that people listening or watching might have. Who can do this? Um, so, uh, Emily, who can do this um, a particular grow along? So we've set up a registration for anyone in the listening area that is Illinois or the surrounding states. So um, we do have a limited supply of seeds. Um, this is our first time doing this. We wanted to be responsible with you know how much seed we, we bought. Like we're not dedicating our entire gardens to to this so in case this is of zero interest to anybody we didn't want to have all of the seed left for the three of us i don't think that'll be the case i hope we've convinced everybody that there's at least something in here that is fun to grow so um go to our registration website we'll link that in the show notes and we'll put it um you know on uh, attached to the youtube um video it will also be in the email that we send for good growing. If you don't get the email um, as a part of the good growing um, suite, I guess, what do, we, what do we call this? What I guess I've never really thought of <laughs> the the good growing empire. Um, <laughs> Multiverse. <but yeah. laughs> um, so we'll put a link in there too. So consider as you're making plans for your garden, think about what and where you want to incorporate one or more of these these plants go to the website we're going to close the registration on april 1st the end of the day april 1st that's not an april fool's joke that'll be closed april 1st the end of the day um so then we can package and mail um all the orders there's no fee to participate we'll send these to you um in the next couple of weeks and so you'll get them in plenty of time to to direct seed them in your garden um, you will get an email. We'll send a follow-up email once all the seeds are in the mail so that you know they're coming. Um, you can expect and, and watch for those seeds to be delivered, um, hopefully in the next couple of days, depending on how quickly um, and how far you are from where we're mailing them. Um, and then you plant them, right? So um, the idea is to be interactive. This is an interactive program or, or a project that we're doing. Please keep in touch with us. You'll have our email. You should have all of our emails. Um, you know, send one of us or all of us, um, you know, a note as to how it's going. There's going to be a survey that we're going to send um, that is going to also give you an opportunity to submit photos. We'll have some questions, some seed questions in there. Haha, <laughs> see what I did there? Um, <laughs> um because we want to hear back from you. So we'll check in. We'll all report back. We're in different um, kind of areas of the state. I'm the farthest north. We've got Chris and Ken, and we'll we'll kind of all see how it's going. Um, good, bad, otherwise, challenges, successes, um, taste test challenges. We just want to, we kind of want to know how, how this goes for folks. So 
Did I miss anything? It's our first nope. time doing it. <laughs> so first did I time. Miss anything? <laughs> I don't think so. Ken, let's reiterate. Who can do this? Illinois or surrounding slash touching states. So it's what yeah. Wisconsin, Iowa, Missouri, Indiana, Kentucky. Yeah. We debate in Michigan because technically borders on Lake Michigan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're from Michigan. Why not? And, and, and it really depends. I mean, I, I'll just add this little caveat, little footnote here. It depends on how many people sign up, if you're able to get seed or not. Um, we will uh we will try to get uh seed to everyone that that does register um if you're not in those surrounding states send us a note i mean if we don't have an overwhelming i i don't want to be left with all of the seeds so um at least reach out um and if we do have extra stock we'll see about sending that out to you um but we just kind of wanted to tie it into the midwest as best we could as emily said we don't have that much left ken where do we go where where do people go to register so you go to go.illinois.edu slash grow along. Mm -hmm. And and when does the registration close? April 1st. It's not an April and Fool's joke. Not, not an April Fool's joke. Um, how much does it cost? Zero dollars. Zip. Zip. Can't argue with that. Um, and when will we mail out the seed? After Middle registration. April. Yes. I, I'm making... Got to make these notes right now. So, um, all right, we have to remember to do all this stuff, guys, now that we said we're going to. All right. Um, and we want feedback. Um, uh, we'll have a survey go out, as Emily described. Send us pictures. Say, this is gross. Why would anyone <laughs> ever eat this? Or say, this is the, the, I'm never going to not grow it. So we, we want to know. Can we also ask for, if this is a success, if there are fun things you're growing in your garden this year that you think we should try to grow next year, mm. I would be open to suggestions for next year's grow along. Yes. Crowdsource it. Yep. I like it. Dig it. Okay. Should we close it? Is it time for the closing portion of the podcast? I think I so. I believe so. Yep. Cue the music. Here we go. Well, that was a lot of great information about some new things you can try in the garden. So don't forget, go to go.illinois.edu slash grow along to grow along with us here at Good Growing this summer. Uh, we will mail you the seeds that you need to try something new, try something different. Ah, it's going to be so much fun. Well, the Good Growing Podcast is a production of University of Illinois Extension, edited this week by Ken Johnson. A special thank you to Emily and Ken. Emily, thank you very much for being here with us uh, to chat about growing unique things and, and getting this new project off the ground. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I thank everybody who's going to participate. It's going to be fun to grow along together. And thank you, Ken, hanging out at, with us, as always, every single week uh, to chat about some of the weird things that we will grow this year. Uh, this is this has been a tradition for us every year, so it, there's another one in the bag for us. Yes, yes. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Chris, for roping me into this. It should be fun. And everybody who chooses to participate, it'll be fun. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> and uh, let's do this again next week. Oh, we shall do this again next week. It'll be a Garden Bite episode, uh, so look forward to that. Uh, we have a lot more stuff coming down the pipeline for the spring, so we are excited to grow along with you. Don't forget, go.illinois.edu slash grow along. That's the registration. You'll, that's the only place you'll find it. Uh, so listeners, thank you for doing what you do best, and that is listening, or if you're watching this on YouTube, watching. And as always, keep on growing. Zebra. There's a there's a study on invasive ants in Africa and how they affect the acacia trees because the zebra the acacia ants that live in the trees aren't there. They push them out. So then elephants overgraze the acacia trees, which reduces the lion's cover, which means zebras are better able to get away. Okay. Thank you. And I'd love to read that. What it sounded like was that the ants were like by what just happened? Was oh. very confusing. <laughs> You're Acacia summary. Ants. Acacia ants bite the uh, elephants.
get in their trunks and bother them. That's not nice. Why did you go down this hole, Ken, of, <laughs> of ant, invasive ants in Africa? <laughs> what drove you to this? I don't know. Madness. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Off to a good start, guys. Yep. 